Welcome back. <laughs> Good to see you again, Justice Kennedy. Uh, Benjamin Eisenberg on behalf of the petitioner, Jennifer Woodward. We're here today based on a direct conflict of cases regarding the trial court, whether the trial court must ensure transcription of direct criminal contempt proceedings. There really are two inquiries in this case. The first is whether or not the trial court has the duty to ensure transcription, and the second is the remedy once the trial judge. Counsel, can I, can I ask sure. you a question? Just I want to factually understand the record. Sure. Um, my understanding is March 2nd of 2016, there was a hearing before the trial court judge. On a probate proceeding, yes, that's correct. It's an adversarial probate proceeding, right. And in that case, uh, the defendant in this case, Ms. Woodward, was asked to leave, and she was excused. Uh, Following that hearing, the attorney for the probate matter, I believe, filed a petition asking the trial court judge to hold her in contempt for uh, alleged misrepresentations that she made at the March 2nd hearing. Yes, Your Honor. And then there was a hearing, another hearing that took place on March 17th of 2016, where she showed up, and she was at that time uh, represented by another lawyer, um, for a very brief period. For a very brief time, and then there was a conflict of interest that uh, that occurred, and as a result of that, he withdrew from representing her, and she was left there uh, unrepresented during this March 17th hearing. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And during that March 17th hearing, there um, that Miss Woodward told the judge, that in fact, she did not say those statements. Yes. And the judge said, "You did, in fact, say those statements." But the transcript shows that, in fact, she did not make those statements because she had been asked to leave. At but, the March 2nd hearing. And, Your Honor, I'll clarify just that at the time of the March 17th hearing, there was no, there had not been an order to show cause yet. So she hadn't yet been charged with indirect criminal contempt. So the hearing on that was held later, and unfortunately that is the one we don't have the transcripts to. Right. So then there, there, then an order to show cause issues, correct? To say, and then and I guess there's like two dates. There's an initial date, and then there's a reset. second date of June. But during the March 17th hearing, um, the trial court judge directs Ms. Woodward, as she's trying to answer, to uh, answer the question, although she's trying to answer the question. My question is, for June 17th, there is this order to show cause, and that is an order to show cause on an indirect criminal contempt hearing, correct? On yes, the, Your Honor. On what transpired on the March 2nd hearing? Yes, Your Honor. There is no counsel present. No, there's none on the record, and the public defender did not file a notice of appearance, and she didn't file an indigency affidavit until 11 days after she was convicted and sentenced. Did the trial court judge advise her, even at the March uh, 17th hearing, that she had the ability to retain counsel or that he could uh, assign counsel to her? She indicated at the hearing that she would like the opportunity to attain counsel, but he ne the trial judge at Spicer never mentioned that she would be entitled to counsel. And that's because at that time she had not been charged with contempt. Uh, we don't know what happened at the June 17th hearing because there's no transcript. And, and that, that is the problem. And, and but at the March 17th hearing, this is my concern, is the March okay. 17th hearing, not the March 17th hearing, but the, the June, June 17th hearing. That is, it was noticed as an indirect criminal contempt hearing at that moment in time. It did, I, I don't believe the show cause order specifically said indirect criminal contempt. However, it said in order to show cause why you should not be held in contempt but and monetarily only, sanctioned. It was solely for purposes of what transpired at the March 2nd hearing. Yes, and, okay. and Your Honor, in this appeal to the Fourth District Court of Appeal, that, that finding was challenged and reversed. But uh, should, should there not have been, since at, at the June 17th hearing, because it was premised on indirect criminal contempt, should there not have been, at that moment in time, a transcription or a recording of the proceeding? There absolutely should the have been. Uh, and that belies the problem of why we need to have transcripts in direct criminal contempt proceedings. The trial judge in this case com uh, committed multiple errors as it relates to the indirect criminal contempt proceedings. And Justice Lagoa just pointed out several of them. Uh, whether or not the due process limits, I know that, the, that this court has recognized and several district courts of appeal have recognized that there are limitations on due process for direct criminal contempt. However, indirect criminal contempt defendants are entitled to the full penalty of due process you. rights. Judge, Judge Gross uh, wrote the opinion for the fourth DCA and he distinguished in that opinion the difference uh, between direct and indirect criminal contempt. He noted this, uh, the need to quickly reassert order in the courtroom justifies immediate action instead of a delay 
to ensure the existence of a record of the proceeding. So the, 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 the issue that, that I have with what you're saying is that in, when we're dealing with direct criminal contempt, that is something the judge actually saw, something heard, or both happen in the presence of the court. Uh, if there was no court reporter present, for example, let's say this wasn't an indirect criminal contempt proceeding. Let's say it was an eviction hearing in Palm Beach County, and mm -hmm. the defendant or whoever it was acted up and was held in contempt. I mean, typically in eviction proceedings, uh, there's no record. In Palm Beach County, there may be because it's recordings, but in some courthouses around the state, there's no record. Uh, by the time you get a court reporter and bring her in, the incident has happened. Well, how, how, how can that occur? Well, that is, there's a difference between the recital of facts, which is required by Rule 3.830, and then the actual proceedings of due process. Of are, course, you saying, are you saying this recital of facts by, by Judge Spicer is not sufficient? It is insufficient to, to lay a record as to whether or not he complied with the due process requirements of 3.830, because we have no idea other than the recital of facts of what he said happened occurred. Did he allow, I mean, do we have any evidence that he allowed the, uh, evidence or to present evidence of excusing or mitigating circumstances in that order? No, Your Honor, and that's the problem. There's no evidence on the record that he complied with the requirements, and every district court of appeals... Also, I mean, I, I mean, when I read the, the order, I mean, it's unclear to me, frankly, that it even happened it may on not that have. date because it doesn't... Since there was that March... My concern is the following, and I, I'm addressing this to the state as well. My concern is, is that on March 17th, there is a hearing where the trial court judge... Uh, repeatedly told Miss Woodward to answer the question. There is no transcript of June 17th, and I understand that, but there should have been because it was held supposed to be an indirect criminal yes, contempt proceeding. But here we are, and something allegedly happened, but I don't even know that it happened on June 17th because the order that is entered in the record doesn't even tell me that a hearing occurred on this day. And, that's and the that this is what happened on this day. For all I know, that's what happened on March 17th. Yeah, Your Honor, exactly. And there are multiple errors. As I point out, there's multiple errors that occurred as the indirect criminal contempt conviction. So the, would, would, would it be okay if the order had – I think this is in response to your, your answer to Justice Labarga's question. If the order had said, I, this happened, and then I asked, uh, why should I not hold you in contempt? Um, uh, can you give me any mitigation? And then sentence. In other words – laid out every single thing that happened in there, would we have a problem or would we not have a problem? I believe we still have a problem. Why is that? Because, because that, that's what I'm, so okay. that, that, I think the answer to Justice Barr's question wasn't quite right because that's not where you're going. You're going something even further than that. Well, so I want to answer Justice Labarga's question and then I'll transition okay. then to yours. Well, Justice Labarga's question, uh, in Palm Beach County, as you mentioned, everything is recorded audio. All I'd have to do for the trial judge in this case would tell the clerk to turn on the recording and they could make a transcript to be that easy. But that's not true in everywhere else. I know. In, in every other county, that's not true. However, there are alternatives. You can, there can be audio recording devices there or every criminal or every county obviously has a criminal court. They can hold put the defendant in the holding so cell. I, this is where I need to stop you because I, okay. I, I, I'll, I'll just speak for Miami-Dade County where I'm from. But the criminal courthouse is in a separate building in some cases from county courts 20 to 30 miles from where this happened. In the county courthouses, there isn't a recording device unless there's a court reporter that's there in the building there. There isn't one available next door or just I can pull one in as your brief seems to indicate. I just, this creates practical problems and that's in Miami-Dade. I can only imagine in some more rural counties where even though there is a criminal courthouse there that these facilities or court reporters are not necessarily available like that. Well, I'd say that that's a consideration the trial judge has to make before he, he or she institutes criminal proceedings. And that was what... Isn't that directly contrary to the, what, what Justice Labarga read is the exact purpose of criminal contempt, which is to remedy a situation immediately on the spot based on personal observation of the trial court judge. I, that, and that can be done by removing the defendant from the courtroom and putting them in a holding cell until a court reporter... So you, you prefer to have someone in jail uh, instead, uh, to hold them in jail while a court reporter comes if, rather than just ha, rather than just do the proceedings, have the, the hearing right there, and then give a sentence which might not include jail? I wouldn't necessarily prefer that they be in jail. They can also be given a notice to return. However... I would, I would note that I prefer that the defendant have a transcript rather than having no transcript at all. And the problem, and I was going to get back to your question, is whether or not if the judge had gone through the procedural history on the record, that would be sufficient. 
The problem is both the, both the United States Supreme Court and this court have repeatedly said that contempt is, is a crime and is uniquely liable to abuse. Uh, within Plank, which I want to know uh, on the procedural history, Plank was asked the issue of whether or not a defendant in criminal, dark criminal contempt is entitled to counsel was not a majority opinion. It was actually three to three on that issue, and Chief Justice Candy concurred in result only. But in that regard, in Plank, this court discussed Bloom. And in Bloom, if you look at it, it was the United States Supreme Court. They go through the history, dating back to the, the Judiciary Act of 1789, about how abuses did happen. And that's why there was a curtailment on the contempt powers. So here we have a situation where you have a type of proceeding that is uniquely liable for abuse. We're letting the trial judge not only prosecute someone summarily without the assistance of counsel, but then the trial court gets to make the record. If you look at, and that is a problem because the trial judge is sitting there not only as the, the judge in a case as they usually would, but they're also the prosecutor, they're the one that decided to institute charges. And we have situations like the present where, as Justice Legault pointed out, if you look at just the indirect criminal contempt, we have multiple layers. Um, ultimately, I'm not here challenging the indirect criminal contempt because I've won at the Fourth District Court Appeal on that issue because the March 2nd hearing doesn't show the contemptuous acts that were set, that were set forth. If you don't have a transcript, we don't know that that would be... Uh, yeah, I, was going, I was going to suggest perhaps a compromise. Uh, I was going to suggest perhaps the, uh, the, the order uh, here. I mean, when a judge is contemplating holding somebody in direct criminal contempt, in open court, the judge is required to tell the person, I'm considering holding you in contempt. I am now giving you an opportunity to present any mitigation you may have before I make a decision. Something like that the judge is supposed to say. Once the decision is made to hold somebody in contempt, the judge is required to do a judgment, an, an order. Uh, I would think that perhaps if, if you're going to hold somebody in contempt and throw them in jail for 15 days, I, I, I would probably go to my laptop. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, how about if the order actually says, uh, in mitigation, the defendant uh, presented the following, A, B, C, D. And after due consideration to those cons uh, mitigation factors, I find that they do not outweigh the behavior presented in court and therefore holding her in contempt or him in contempt. I guess you would not like that because she said that because the judge is necessarily involved in the prosecution and the sentencing. Yeah, and, that, and that's going to be my basic response to that. Uh, in, in the decision of Henry Oliver, the United States Supreme Court said that contempt is not to be considered as an unlimited abandonment to the basics due process procedural safeguards. And the United States Supreme Court has said for, for decades, going back to Griffin versus Illinois, Mayor versus City of Chicago, that defendants are, criminal defendants are entitled to a record sufficient for appellate review, whether they're indigent or not. And, and there, there, there's a prejudice component to that, isn't there? Well, there is a prejudice component. So have you alleged any prejudice? Well, the problem in this case is I can't allege prejudice because you have a defendant who is pro se, who has been, who we have no decision. So the, the answer is no? The answer is no. Okay. I can't. Well, you, you can't ask your client where you asked mitigation? I have asked my client, but she is not someone that can relay that in, in a particular way. The problem is that Rule 3.830, courts have held that, that epitomizes due process. So there has to be script, uh, scrupulous compliance. And this isn't a situation well, where I mean, you need to. It, it, so what's your answer to the state's point, though, about your ability under the, under the appellate rules to include something in the record that's even, if necessary, in the absence of a transcript, something as simple as the party's recollection? I mean, because in this, it seems like unless we're going to have everything transcribed ex ante, we're not, the thing that's the actual cause for the contempt would happen untranscribed. And so the only thing that you could really get if you were going to have a transcript once the judge thinks that there's an issue is something that would show compliance with 3.830. Well, yeah. So it seems like it could, it could, this record could easily have included something from your client saying, to the best of my recollection, I wasn't given an opportunity to do mitigation or X, Y, and Z. And then we would have something to review on appeal. The, the problem is, Your Honor, as Judge Casanueva said in a poll, the burden of providing a record in these types of cases has to rest with the trial court because the trial court would seek to exercise its authority to punish by depriving the alleged offender of his liberty. The but problem is, you know, but maybe as to the record, I'm not saying obviously if, the, if your client wanted to, to say something about the underlying conduct, that's one thing, but certainly it's not asking too much for there to at least be a record saying that I was deprived of even the opportunity to 
do X, Y, and Z, but right? The, the problem, though, is that contempt can come out of any type of proceeding. It can come out of criminal, or in this case, it can come out of probate, civil. And you have a person that may not be entitled to counsel, may not have counsel, and they're going to be thrown in jail for a specific, they could be, as in this case, it was 15 days, in other cases, it's months. So you have a person that is unskilled in the law, not a lawyer, we have no idea because there's no front inquiry whether this person would be capable of representing themselves, and they're supposed to know specific pinpoint accuracy about the records so that we can make a subject. Doesn't there, doesn't there have to be at least an attempt to reconstruct? And even, even in DeLap, which we, you choose, cite, and rely on, didn't we say that there has to be an attempt or that it could not be reconstructed, which is why we reversed? But the problem in these cases, Justice Law. Am, am, am I right? Does our it, case law state that? Well, that is what the case law states in a typical criminal proceeding. Right. But the problem is that a direct criminal contempt proceeding is not a, a uh, typical proceeding. And there, you know, for example, the, state, to want, the problem is you seem to want to have it both ways. You seem to want to treat it the same as a regular criminal proceeding, and yet you don't want to treat it the same as a criminal proceeding. Well, I want to say that the defendant still has due process rights, but I also say that it's dif it is a different proceeding because the judge is the prosecutor. Well, let me ask you this. At, at some point, a counsel was appointed. So at the point at which counsel was appointed, couldn't you ask to, to relinquish to reconstruct the record? But the counsel was appointed after she had already been convicted right. and already been you, sentenced. Can you, are you entitled to recreate the record uh, without permission from the appellate court? Uh, well, apparently, according to the Fourth District Court of Appeals' recent decision in Terry, they can sui sponte reconstruct the record. However, the problem is the rules regarding reconstruction and stipulation of the parties don't apply in a direct criminal contempt proceeding because Stipulation of the parties requires stipulation of the parties. When you have a direct criminal contempt proceeding, there is no other party other than the defendant and the judge. And then same thing applies with reconstruction. It has to be settled and approved by the trial judge. And the trial judge, however, is the prosecutor. First of all, you can't, you can't serve your, your facts on a different party because there is no other party. And then you have the judge that was the one that decided to institute the charges is the one that gets to settle and approve. And so the judge gets to make their own record, whereas the easier thing to do is just to do it at the get-go. And I do want to point out just from a practical standpoint, I'm not asking this court to reverse a two-week trial or a month trial or anything like that. Proceedings in the direct uh, criminal contempt are relatively short. I'm just asking that the trial court uh, go back so the trial court can do it right so we can see on the record that due process was followed because as I was going to get into, Rule 3.830 is very specific. It embodies the what due process is in a direct criminal contempt proceeding, and any error in there is fundamental error. That's what every district court would appeal. And the problem is you're depriving a person of counsel to be able to make those a review, and it denies someone due process. I, I see that I'm into my rebuttal time, so I'll reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Heidi Bettendorf, and I'm appearing on behalf of the state of Florida. Counsel, let me ask you a question regarding the, the June hearing. The June hearing was scheduled as an indirect criminal contempt proceeding, correct? It appears that that's correct, yes. So pursuant to Rule 3.840, there are certain requirements that have to be followed, correct? That's correct. So how can this appellate court or the appellate court below, how can we ensure that the trial court complied with the requirements of that rule if there's no transcript here? <clears throat> We're here on a direct criminal contempt, which falls right, under but the hearing, the hearing for that date was noticed as an indirect criminal contempt proceeding, correct? Yes, that's correct. And there is no transcript of that proceeding? That's also correct. All right. And is that not one of the requirements that you are supposed to have for that kind of proceeding? That's also correct. For uh, proceeding under 3.840. Right. Well, that's what the hearing was noticed as, correct? That's what the hearing was noticed as. It was a 30 as. minute hearing? Yes. So let me ask you another question. Under 3.830, that's also something that needs to be scrupulously followed, correct? That's also correct. How can this court ensure that a defendant, uh, that the requirements, the procedural requirements of that rule are met? And how can we ensure that a defendant is given an opportunity to present evidence of uh, mitigating uh, or excusing circumstances without any kind of uh, review, appellate review, in terms of either uh, a recording or a transcript? Well, the rule has always been that in um, under rule, appellate rule 9.200B4, that the parties can reconstruct the record with when there has been an absence of a transcript. If you were to state at, and follow the rule that because this is a criminal proceeding, 
then it always must be reversed for lack of a transcript. That will have widespread effect on all criminal well, proceedings why, when there's why, a lack of a transcript. Why should it not? I mean, if you're throwing someone in jail and you're incarcerating them, why should there not be a moment where we stop and we say, I mean, under the rules right now, Rule 3.720, a sentencing court, and in this case it would be a sentencing court because the sentence shall be pronounced in open court under Rule 3.830, correct? Yes shall ensure that a record of the entire sentencing proceeding is made and preserved in such a manner that it can be transcribed as needed. That did not occur here, correct? That's also correct. But, Your Honor, I would point to this Court's recent opinion in Plank, where it stated that the more specific rule controls over the more general rule. And because Rule 3.830 specifically deals with summary criminal contempt, the State would argue that Rule 3.0 takes precedence over the rule regarding the sentencing transcript. Well, but here, 3.830 just says sentence shall be pronounced in open court. How does that conflict with 3.721 that says it has to be made and preserved in such a manner that it can be transcribed as, as needed? Because as a summary proceeding, Rule 3.830 does not necessarily re require that there be a transcript. It's a summary proceeding. Well, I understand that, but the problem that I have here is that that hearing, assuming it took place, that hearing was an indirect criminal proceeding hearing, correct? It was under 3.840, not 3.830. Well, we can assume that, but I don't know that that's necessarily correct because we don't have a transcript of that hearing. Well, you but have, you have, a, you have a, uh, a notice of hearing, an order to show cause, correct, for that date? Yes. And the order to show cause was under 3.840. 4.0, not 3.830. But, but an order to show cause is not required under 3.830. I understand that, counsel. But the point is, in this case, it's either a yes or a no. The notice of hearing, the order to show cause that went out, was solely for the alleged misrepresentations that were made at a March 2nd hearing, correct? Yes, that is correct. And that was supposed to, supposed to be an indirect criminal uh, proceeding? Yes, that is what the notice states. Okay. And there is no recording of what happened during that transcript. That is that also hearing, correct. Even though there should have been because it was noticed as a 3.840. That's also correct. Okay. So, but in the middle of that 3.840 hearing, assuming it happened, because I don't know, because frankly, can you tell me when you look at this order that it says that this happened on that date? No, but I can tell looking at that order that the contumacious behavior happened on March 2nd and March 17th based on the transcripts of those hearings that we have. Are you alleging, are you suggesting that contumacious behavior happened on March 2nd when you can read the transcript and it shows it did not occur? I, I am um, arguing that the contumacious behavior that constitutes the direct criminal contempt happened at both the March 2nd and the March 17th hearings. The fourth DCA found that the contumacious behavior that comprises the indirect criminal contempt did not happen at those hearings. And what was the direct contumacious behavior that occurred? Where do you say that it happened? Are you saying it happened at March 17th? No, I'm saying that on March 2nd, petitioner made outbursts and continued to make outbursts after being warned, and she also heckled one of the attorneys. It's clearly shown by but the it, transcript. No, <clears throat> but if, if that was going to be handled as direct criminal contempt, it would have had to have been done on March 2nd. She was uh, removed from the courtroom on March 2nd. But, but under our rules, I mean, you have two options. Right. One, you deal with it immediately as direct, or you notice it and handle it as indirect. You can't, you can't set off and, and decide to deal with something weeks later as direct criminal contempt. You have to deal with that immediately, correct, or am I wrong about that? Well, Your Honor, that's a gray area. We have two rules, 3.830, that deals with direct and, and contemplates a summary procedure, and right. it doesn't state how long there must be a break between the contumacious behavior and the entry of the sentencing order. And then we I have... Mean, I've always understood it to mean immediately. Right. I, th yeah. th this is I mean, my concern, that's... counsel. My concern is, is that when I look at this order, okay, what is alleged to be direct contempt is her uh, not answering questions. There is a hearing on March 17th where the trial judge says that she's not answering questions. That's March 17th. That cannot be direct criminal contempt. And this order does not tell me when this direct criminal contempt occurred. And in order for it to be direct criminal contempt, it has to have happened on June 17th. Your Honor, I understand your concern. There is evidence in this record that contumacious behavior was engaged in on March 2nd and that the order was not entered until three months later. Okay. 
All right. So, I, I concede that to you. That, so that, that's the state, I just want to be clear, that's the state's position that, that the contumacious behavior that we're talking about here occurred in the March hearings, one or the other, not in June. Yes, that's the state's contention. Okay. I think you made it an easier case. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I said I think you made it an easier case. For yeah, myself or for my opponent? Well, that, that's yet to be seen. <laughs> hasn't this whole thing been hasn't this whole thing been litigated as if the direct contempt arose out of something that happened in June? I mean, because we've been talking about there not being transcripts when there are transcripts for the March stuff. Well, my opponent has never argued that her behavior did not constitute contumacious behavior. So as far as your point, Justice Lagoa, about whether the behavior outlined in the judge's order constitutes um, direct criminal contempt, that's been waived by my opponent. I, I, don't, I'm, I don't make points. I'm just asking questions because I am concerned that, uh, frankly, a trial court judge and an attorney who is supposed to be an officer of the court filed a petition and an order to show cause on someone when they had a hearing transcript that showed that in fact there was no contumacious behavior, that the alleged misrepresentation that they accused this woman of doing did not occur. And in fact, frankly, if anything, they're the ones that should be reported to the bar. Because I, I find it, frankly, very, very upsetting that someone can be thrown in jail for when they have a transcript that shows that in fact that did not occur. Justice Lagoa, I can understand your outrage. However, there is part of the contumacious behavior contained in the order that did occur. Unfortunately, the order to show cause only talks about the misrepresentations made on March 2nd regarding the, whether they or not had vacated the premises. That is it. And you have to give notice, per, correct, under 3.840 as to what you're being accused of. Yes, that is correct. Right. And the only accusation is that, the misrepresentation. No, the accusation also includes that she um, was disruptive in the courtroom. And that, that is not she... in the order to show cause, counsel. Show me yes, where it is I'm, in the I'm order sorry, to show cause. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. Okay. I thought you were talking about the order finding her in contempt. I'm sorry, Justice Munoz, you were asking me a question and I didn't get a chance to finish it. Do you recall what it was? No, I, I mean, I'm really just, I think we're kind of saying the same thing. The order to show cause said that the specific purpose of that June hearing was going to be to talk about the alleged lying about whether she was living in the house. There wasn't anything about her bad, her alleged bad behavior in, in March. The way this was briefed and litigated, I think all of us assumed that, the issue, that whatever the direct contempt behavior was occurred in June and that part of the problem was we didn't know what the behavior was and we didn't know whether the procedural, you know, the, the 3.830 um, procedural things were followed and now you're saying that the direct contempt was actually based on what happened in March when there was a transcript which to me at least that's news I mean I didn't the way everything has been put to, to us I didn't think that that was the case well your honor based on the way that my opponent just stood up here and argued the case it does not appear that the attorney listed in the order um, the direct criminal contempt portion of the order Mr. Mansiri was at the June 17th hearing. He just argued to you that there was only the judge and the contemnor at the hearing. And thus he was not able to fairly be able to reconstruct the record because the judge and the contemnor would be the only ones available I mean, to help the, reconstruct the, the record. The DCA opinion is really clear. It says there was, there was a March hearing, there was a transcript, there's a March hearing, there's a transcript. And then we get to the indirect criminal contempt hearing. There was no court reporter, therefore there was no transcript. And so it's a reversal on the indirect, but, and then it gets down to the direct criminal contempt and said, because there's no transcript, there was no hearing available. That, I mean, it was, it was, it looks like to the fifth, to the fourth, it was argued as if that was the problem. And that's the whole conflict issue is based on the assumption that the direct criminal contempt occurred at the hearing on the indirect criminal contempt matter where there was no court reporter. We're here on a conflict that assumes that that's where the di direct criminal co contempt happened. That's where how the Fort DCA decided the issue by saying there didn't have to be a court reporter at that hearing. It makes, so, I mean, it, it sounds like we're being, uh, the whole conflict issue is based on a, a, a different understanding than the way you're presenting this. Well, I, you can ask my opponent when he stands back up here for rebuttal, but the state has always um, presumed that the 
Rule 3.830, certain elements of Rule 3.830 were met in the first two hearings. However, the rest of the, um, the other, the, there were three components of Rule 3.830 that would be contained in the sentencing hearing. I mean, then the issue at the fourth should have been, can you wait that long to enter an order after the direct criminal contempt proceedings? And the issue would be, it would clearly be in a reversal because the transcript of the March hearings does not indicate that the trial judge gave, had a summary proceedings. There was no opportunity to offer mitigation. There was nothing. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if the understanding was that that was the summary proceeding and it was just reflected later, then I think the fourth would have reversed clearly because the law is sufficiently clear and uncontested that you have to offer an opportunity for mitigation during the hearing. It just doesn't make sense that the, you're now saying that the... Justice Lawson, I believe that you're completely correct that it should have been argued to the fourth DCA. If my opponent was arguing that too long of a period of time occurred between the March hearings and the June hearing, except that my opponent has never argued that and therefore that issue has been waived as to whether this really qualifies as a summary proceeding or whether this should be um, have been conducted under Rule 3.840 as an indirect you, criminal you contempt have, proceeding. There. Just to clarify, because my head's spinning right now, <laughs> and it usually doesn't spin, but it's spinning. Uh, there were two hearings, right? Yes, there were. Okay. There was the one that she was noticed to come to, the Our indirect second. criminal contempt hearing, correct? I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor, there were three hearings. Oh, no, you really got me spinning. <laughs> No, let's just stick to the first two. To the first two. Okay, now, there's the one where she was noticed to come to uh, the indirect criminal contempt proceeding. Am I correct? That would be the third hearing. That's the third that hearing. The third That's hearing. the third hearing, yes, sir. Well, I've got to well, read she this. had two hearings. So the March there's a March 2nd hearing. Yes. So which, which hearing is the direct contempt uh, uh, applied to? There's a, there's a March 2nd hearing where she clearly engaged in consummationist behavior but and she there was, was removed there was from no, the courtroom. There was no summary proceeding at that hearing. We know that because we have a transcript. That's correct. Okay. Right. So and, there, and none either at March 17th. That and, is, and that's my concern because the order on appeal, when I read the March 17th hearing, it assumed to me that what, what this is talking about is what happened on March 17th where she didn't answer questions, although she was trying to answer questions. But the circus-like atmosphere and where she was talking back to the attorney happened in the March 2nd. I, I understand hearing. that. I understand that, but that's why I asked That's not these. the one that she was held in direct contempt for. No. Uh, it's, she, in, how, it's in the how, factual how know, statement. How do we know supporting. that happened just March 2nd? Well, we don't know that it solely happened March 2nd, but it's clear that from the record that we have that it did happen on March 2nd. What we... But how we do are, we know that that behavior was ever an issue? I mean, there's nothing that would lead us to believe that. I, I, I mean, I understand you're, you can, you're pointing to that as some record evidence that she was uh, acting up, and it's there. Uh, but I, I just don't understand how that connects with this subsequent uh, order that was issued. Well, Your Honor, the state's main point on appeal was, and still is, that the defendant has not done what she needs to do in order to preserve this record for appeal. That there was, while there was no court reporter at the proceeding, the defendant has done nothing under Florida Rule of Appellate Procedure 9.200B4 in order to but, attempt but, to reconstruct the record. But then we, record. Go, we go back to my original question, which is that hearing on June 17th was an indirect, was an order to show cause as an under 3.840, an indirect criminal contempt proceeding where a transcript and a reporter should have been because it was an order to show cause for indirect criminal contempt because that's what was noticed. But that, following along with what Justice Kennedy just asked me, that does not mean that there was this is not the scenario that I present to the court. However, it does not mean that there was no directly contumacious behavior that would fall under Rule 3.830 committed at the June hearing. We have no way of knowing, even though it was an indirect criminal contempt hearing, we have no way of knowing whether there was any direct criminal contempt engaged in at that hearing because this court and the parties haven't been provided with a transcript or even a summary but of then the facts why, of the But hearing. then that goes back to Justice Labarga's question, which is why should there not be a requirement in a 
in a case not let's let's take out the indirect criminal contempt the order to show cause why should there not be a requirement under the rule that a trial court judge if you're holding someone in direct criminal contempt in order to preserve for uh, appellate review the record I understand that not everyone has the ability to have a recording or uh, a court reporter there so why should there not be a written record an order where you go through what the factors are that you need to do under 3.830 and you ask was there mitigation did they present mitigation did you advise them I advised them that they had the right to have mitigation and I considered the mitigation and I, I found that they were did not warrant uh, uh, me reversing my the findings of contempt currently the rules do not require that however these are rules of um, criminal procedure and this court can modify the rules of criminal procedure at any time and so therefore I would not say that it should never be required if this court were to determine that it wanted to modify the rules in order to clarify how long a summary proceeding should last to return to your um, question that you asked me Justice Luck or whether there should be certain elements contained even more so than what is already requ required by rule 3.83 and 3.840, this court is certainly able to do that. And so I would not say that there is anything prohibiting that. It's just that right now it's not contained in the rule. And if I could just quickly return to um, what Justice Luck and Justice Lawson, the points that they were making about a summary proceeding. There, um, the, the effect of a summary proceeding goes back to what my opponent was arguing. If you stop the proceedings and you're in a rural county or a county that is not recording and it takes a day to get a court reporter in order to transcribe the sentencing portion of a direct criminal contempt, which is the portion that I consider to be where the defendant has the opportunity to present um, mitigating factors and the uh, sentence is pronounced on the record. Well, you also have the, that's also required under 3.830, under direct. Yes, that's, that's what I'm speaking oh, of. Okay. So if, if you adjourn, how long of an adjournment is it no longer considered a summary proceeding and then it becomes a proceeding under rule 3.840 because it's no longer a summary proceeding because now we're waiting for a court reporter. And so we, this court would then have to walk a fine line. Is it, is it one day, is it two days, depending on what's going on in the world. But that's not the, the difference between 3.830 and 3.840 is whether or not it happened in front of the court. If it's a direct criminal contempt, it's something that the court witnessed, the judge saw personally. Uh, it can't be something that a bailiff outside uh, the courtroom says, this, the defendant when he walked out or the plaintiff when she walked out it swore at the court. No, then that would be indirect criminal contempt. Understood, Your Honor, except that the point that the other two justices were making was that under Rule 3.830 for direct criminal contempt, it provides for a summary proceeding. And I believe that the point that they were making is when you have, as the state is alleging on the record, that the contumacious behavior was engaged in on March 2nd and 17th, but then the order is not is not entered and the defendant presumably, although we don't have a transcript, was given the, the other protections under 3.830, then it is no longer a summary proceeding. And so I would, I would argue to the court that when you are going to dismiss proceedings in order to have them then be transcribed, it, you take it out of the realm of a summary proceeding and then every contempt proceeding becomes an indirect criminal percent, uh, should follow under rule 3.840 because it is no longer a summary proceeding. Um, I see that I'm out of time, is that correct? You're about a minute over time. Okay. Um, I'm generous. Can you sum up, please? Yes. The state, excuse me for one second. The state would suggest that rather than um, reverse the trial court's ruling for lack of a, a transcript, it should instead continue with its line of case law, which holds that a criminal defendant must first allege a prejudicial error and second attempt to reconstruct the proceedings. Thank you. Mr. Eisenberg, let me just clarify that um, your brief raises a single issue, and that issue is that the June hearing had to be, you treat it as a direct criminal contempt hearing, and that direct criminal contempt hearing on June 17th had to be transcribed, and that's the error that you're seeking us. Yes, it for. began as an indirect criminal contempt proceeding, but at some point it became a direct criminal contempt right. proceeding. It's contrary to reason 
that we have the March 2nd and March, 7th, uh, March 2nd and March 17th hearings, of which we have transcribed. At no point did the trial judge say that he was going to hold her in direct criminal contempt at that point. After those hearings, the trial judge enters an order to show cause, which specifically says the reason that he's going to hold the defendant in contempt, which is alleged misrepresentations at the March 2nd hearing. If the trial judge was considering holding her in direct criminal contempt based on her actions at the prior hearing, then it should have, should have stayed for it. But to get to the main point, the fact that we're even having this debate about when the contemptuous actions occurred is the reason that we need to have at least an adequate record in direct criminal contempt proceedings. I'd just like to note that in, in, re, in, uh, in, in re inquiry concerning Perry in 1994, this court said it is extremely important that trial judges protect a contempt offender's due process rights, particularly when the punishment can, results in the imprisonment of the offender. The problems in cases like direct formal contempt, as the U.S. Supreme Court said in Bagwell, it goes to the contumacy, or it goes to the ire of, in the center of the court. It is, as they said, contumacy often strikes at the most vulnerable and human qualities of a trial judge's temperament and its fusion of legislative, executive, and judicial power summons forth the prospect of the most tyrannical licentiousness. There are so many issues in this case related to the indirect criminal contempt and without an adequate record, without anything in the record, we cannot determine whether those errors also seeped out into the direct criminal contempt. For all those reasons, I'd ask that this court reverse. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments. We now proceed to the fifth and final case on today's